All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, so this is my last TA session. Um, and tomorrow you will have your second midterm. And so we have uh, an additional office hour this afternoon. All right. So if you have questions to ask, you can come to the afternoon office hour. And then tomorrow morning, we will have the exam administered online. Um, it's similar to last time, but this time, um, you're not going to go to the quizzes. You just go to the assignments and then click the uh, midterm exam part two, and then just submit your answers there. I will upload the exam tomorrow morning so that you can just download the exam and then just uh, answer the questions and um, scan your answers and upload a PDF um, to the assignment page instead of the quiz page. So there is really no uh, restriction on the number of attempts. So you can submit multiple times, just make sure that you submit your answers and that's all that is important. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen. I would like to um, talk about the coverage again. Some of you are still a little bit confused about uh, what will be in the second midterm. So there won't be a lot of things in the second midterm because we only have two weeks um, after the first one and before the second one, right? So we won't be able to test you a lot of the things and we don't intend to make the exams cumulative. So again, all right, so the coverage is chapters three and four, but because we didn't cover 3.5 and 4.4, .4, so you can ignore those two sections. Just focus on 3.1 to 3.4, 4.1 to 4.3, and 4.5. And actually for chapter three, you just need to focus on three points. Okay. Um, question? Oh yeah, sorry, what do you mean by only call Douglas next to it? Um, yes, so we talked about a few utility functions, right? But we only want to test you on the Cobb Douglas utility function instead of perfect substitutes, perfect complements, or quasi-linear. So if you find that, um, okay, so if you see other types of utility functions, you can basically ignore them. So if it is Cobb-Douglas, then just read, okay? So I think in the textbook, they have a lot of discussions about other types of utility functions, but we really don't focus on those. All right, and then um, for lecture recordings, just watch um, lecture seven and lecture eight. Only the two uh, lectures. Um, I'm sorry, I, I think I hear some noises from, uh, from you guys. So if you can just mute yourself, uh, that would be nice for other students too, so that they can hear me. And, so I have another question. Okay. So uh, when you're talking about so even though we looked into it, like in other utility functions, we only need to know how to maximize our everything with respect to Cobb Douglas, right? Yes, that's correct. Okay, but so I mean, it is still useful. We have perfect uh, complements, right? Yeah. And that one is out of the picture for the second meter. Okay, but do we still need to know that with respect to the final? Like it's still a good thing to know? Um, not really. Okay. Every exam is independent. So you just need to focus on what is discussed, okay? Okay. the certain period of time. Okay, thank not you. Not before. Um, and also for TA sessions, just focus on these two weeks. So I've provided um, TA notes, TA appendix, just read those materials within these two um, weeks. And also I think it's enough to just rely on the TA sessions and the lecture recordings. If you don't have time to read the textbook, I know you guys may have other midterm exams. 
it's okay to just rely on the lectures and TA sessions. So today's plan um, is very simple. Uh, we just wrap up um, some remaining issues and then we do some sample questions. Um, so here are a few things that I still need to talk about before the exam. So one is um, the relationship between um, the Slutsky equation and the types of goods. So we have normal good and inferior good. And we just want to discuss for a normal good and for an inferior good, what the Slutsky equation will be look like. Um, okay. So here, this is the Slutsky equation, right? And you may notice that the notation is slightly different from the TA note. So in the TA note, I use D to denote the Marshallian demand. And here I just use X star, okay? X star, the star is the Marshallian demand. And H is the Higgsian demand. And when you notice that there is a, a subscript X, it's saying that it's a Higgsian demand for X. So the formula is, okay, the total effect is equal to the income effect plus the substitution effect. And what is the total effect? The total effect is simply um, the derivative of the ordinary demand uh, with respect to the price. And here we are interested in the effect of the price of X on um, the ordinary demand of good X. So that will be the total effect, right? That's what, that will be the dynamic on an ordinary demand curve. And we can decompose it into two parts. One is the income effect, which is the change of your demand due to the change of your purchasing power. And the second part is substitution effect, which is the change of your demand due to the change of the relative prices. Okay, so here the direction is we want to increase the price of X marginally and see the effect. So according to the law of demand, okay, when the price is higher, demand should be lower, right? So if it is consistent with the law of demand, then the total effect should be negative. Because when the price of X increases, your demand for good X should be lower. But let's take a look at each component. What's the income effect? Income effect is talking about the effect of the purchasing power. So here, when the price of X increases, your purchasing power should be lower because now things are more expensive so you can afford less. So it's like you have less income. Technically, you still have the same income, but your purchasing power is lower. We want to measure that effect. So when your purchasing power is lower, for a normal good, you should buy less, right? So the effect of a lower income on the demand should be negative for a normal good. So we should expect the income effect to be negative for a normal good. Um, but mathematically, we can also know why it should be negative. So in this term, okay, we have a negative sign. And X star is the demand, right? So the second part is the X star. So something multiplied by X star. So that X star is positive. So we don't need to worry about that. What about the derivative of X star with respect to I? So for a normal good, so this derivative means that how X star will change when you increase I marginally. And because it's a normal good, right? So when you increase I, X star should be higher because it's normal good. You will buy more when you have more income. So this derivative is also positive x star is positive, so the multiplication is positive. But because we have a negative sign in this term, so in total, it's a negative term. So mathematically, we can also realize that it's a negative term. And for substitution effect, it will always be negative, no matter what type of good you're talking about. 
because the idea of substitution effect is when one good becomes more expensive, you should buy the less expensive one more. So you will substitute toward the other good, which is now less expensive compared to the one that has a higher price now. So substitution effect should be negative always. So you see that since income effect is negative, substitution effect is negative, the sum should also be negative, right? So for normal good, each term should be negative. But for inferior good, things become a little bit complicated. Um, substitution effect is still negative, but income effect should have the opposite sign because for inferior good idea is when you have more income, you buy less. So when your purchase power is lower, you buy more. So that's why this term has an opposite sign. So because of that, we really don't know what's the sum of these two, right? One term is positive and the other term is negative. What's the sum? So it depends on which term has a larger uh, value in, mag in magnitude or in absolute value. So usually the sum should also be negative because uh, we want to have the law of demand, right? If the law of demand is true, then the total effect should be negative. When the price of X increases in total, you should buy um, less. If it is on a demand curve that is downward sloping, but there is one exception. When a good becomes so inferior, okay, the income effect becomes so positive, then the sum becomes positive. So that type of good is what we call given goods. It's so inferior so that income effect outweighs the substitution effect. And as a result, the total effect becomes positive. So that's one thing that I want to talk about, the signs of each term and how to determine if a good is normal or inferior depending on their income effect. So there is another way to determine if a good is normal or inferior. You can just take a look at the derivative of x with respect to i. So it's the first part of the um, the first part of the income effect. Um, so let me circle this part for you. You can just look at this part. So if this derivative is positive, then it's normal good. If this term, this derivative is negative, then it's inferior good. So that's another way to determine if a good is normal or inferior. I think there is a question in the practice um, midterm as well. All right. The second thing that I want to talk about is review preference. So I want to make it clearer. Um, I want to make it more rigorous. So I decide to distinguish directly review preferred from indirectly review preferred. So in uh, the lecture recording, the professor only talked about review preferred, and that one is actually directly review preferred, okay? So here, the notation for directly review preferred is R um, to D, and then the indirect review preferred is just R. So R means reviewed. Um, and D means directly. If you don't have a D, then it's not directly. So what's, what's direct review preferred? Um, so for direct review preferred, the definition is the same as the professor. So if at some prices and income, an individual can afford both bundles A and B individually or separately, but chooses A, then A is directly review preferred to B, okay, written as A, R, D, B. 
But what is indirectly review preferred? Indirectly review preferred means that you cannot observe it directly. You have to use the property of transitivity. So if an individual can never afford both bundles A and C at the same time individually, I mean, when you can afford bundle A, you cannot afford bundle C. When you can afford bundle C, you cannot afford bundle A. So you can never um, have the, so A and C can never be in your opportunity set or in your options. Okay, so when A is the option, C is out of the options. When C is the option, then A is out of the options. But you observe that A are DB, which means A and B can be uh, in your opportunity set at the same time, and you choose A, so A is direct to review preferred to B. And you also observe at some point that B and C are both affordable to you, but you buy uh, bundle B instead of C. So B is review preferred to C, or less rigorously, B is better than C. So if, if you observe that at some point A is better than B, and then at another time point B is better than C, then you can kind of use the transitivity to infer that A is better than C indirectly, right? Then we say that A is indirectly review preferred to C, uh, written as A R C. So this is a review preferred, um, a more complete version of review preferred. Okay, it includes both directly review preferred and indirect review preferred. But it's okay to just use the direct review preferred. Okay, if you are asked to give a definition of say review prefer um, because that's what the professor is talking about but the reason why i want to distinguish these two is because we want to distinguish two axioms of review preference and these two axioms are actually talked about by the professor but he did not specifically name one of the axiom using um, this notation warp the weak axiom of review preference is actually the principle of rationality in the lecture recording. But the professor did talk about the, the SARP, okay, the strong axiom of review preference, okay, after he talked about the principle of rationality. So let's recall what principle of rationality is. So principle of rationality means that if A is review preferred to B, then under any alternative price or income configuration, we cannot have B is review preferred to A. So if B is ever chosen, then it must be that A is no longer affordable. So that's the original words. I just used the notation that we just introduced, right? I did not say A is review preferred to B. I used the notation A, R, D, B, which is equivalent. So that would be the um, the weak axiom. So it means that A and B can be, you know, both affordable, both in your opportunity set. And if you choose A, then it suggests that A is better than B, right? And then maybe at another time point, when you also have the options of choosing A or B, you should continue to choose A. You should not choose B, to suggest that B is better than A, right? Because at some point you already tell us that A is better than B. You cannot change your mind suddenly to say that B is now better than A. That will cause some confliction. It's, it means that your preference is not consistent. So if you ever choose B, then it means that A is out of the picture. A is never affordable, okay, when B is chosen. So that would be the weak axiom. Uh, I will talk about the reason why it is weak. Uh, let's talk about strong axiom of real preference next. So the SARP. So the SARP says that if A is indirectly review preferred to B, which means it can be that A is better than C directly, C is better than B directly. So we infer that A is indirectly better than B. Okay, if that case happens. So A and B 
can so when you determine um, a is better than b a and b are never in the same option set then if suddenly at some point you have both options a and b then you should choose a you should never choose b okay so we cannot have b uh, directly review prefer to a so why is it stronger so here you notice that a the relationship between a and b is indirectly uh, inferred from uh, looking at a chain of prop like a chain of selections a chain of behaviors you can have a uh, r d c c r d d and d r d e and then e r d b okay so eventually so you have a chain and then at the beginning it's a at the end it's b right so that's what the professor wrote i just simplify it by using this indirect review prefer and then we say a is indirect review prefer to b then it cannot happen uh, when b is direct review prefer to a so the reason why it is stronger is because it imposes a stricter restriction of your behavior of the preferences we infer from your behavior so if you have this so at the bottom of this page if you ever notice that a is chosen over c and then c is chosen over b and then b is chosen over a according to the principle of rationality there's no violation of the principle at all right we so when we observe a r d c we never observe c r d a there's no c r d a in this three behaviors and there's no b r d c in these three behaviors even though we have c r d b right so all of them are directly you know infer from the behaviors but um satisfying the principle of rationality is not enough so having this you will create a circle right so when a and c are both affordable uh you choose a and when c and b are both affordable you choose c when b and a are both affordable you choose b what if all three are affordable so when all a b c are affordable we just cannot say which one is better because it, you create a circle so to make sure that we can rank all the bundles when all the bundles are affordable we need to impose a stricter restriction which is the SARP. so here SARP is violated because according to the first two behaviors we can say that a is indirectly review preferred to b which is a r b so from these two um, from these two we can say a r b so if we have a r b we cannot have b r d a right but we see that there is a b r d a so there is a violation of the SARP but there's no violation of the warp so warp is actually a weaker condition that you need to satisfy all right so that's the some um, concepts that i think you need to know before the exam and we will do some uh, practice questions to get you familiar with all those concepts and the calculations that you need to know um, so before that i would like to give you a list of important topics that you need to go back to um, for the exam so um, clearly the first three topics are for the first midterm so just ignore the first three bullet points let's start from the fourth bullet point you need to know um, utility functions here i say it's especially Cobb Douglas. Actually, it's only Cobb Douglas. And then marginal utility in difference curve. Um, actually, at this point, you don't really need to know how to draw in difference curve anymore. Um, marginal rate of substitution, you still need to know how to calculate marginal rate of substitution because it's like in the 
it's like one of the intermediate steps that you need to solve for the UMP, right? And budget line, again, you don't need to know how to draw budget line anymore, but you should know uh, how to calculate the slope, which is the MRT, because we want to have the MRS equals MRT uh, at some point uh, in our calculations. So uh, that's why you still need to know MRS and MRT. And then marginal utility is also important because that's part of the MRS, right? MRS is the ratio of the marginal utilities. So UMP, you still need to know how to solve for an UMP uh, and uh, ordinary demand. It's the solution of the UMP. We also call it Marshallian demand or uncompensated demand and the indirect utility function. So indirect utility function is obtained by plugging in the Marshallian demand into the original utility function. All right. And also you need to know EMP. We just talked about expenditure minimization problem. And the solution to this problem is Hicksian demand or compensated demand. And when you solve for the Hicksian demand, um, plug the Hicksian demand into the objective function, the expenditure uh, expression to get the expenditure function. And then you need to know the relationship between UMP and EMP. You should feel comfortable with starting uh, uh, from any point and then use the relationship to get the other without solving the other. So for example, I talked about starting from the UMP, getting the Marshallian demand, getting the indirectory function, and then rearrange the indirectory function to get the expenditure function and eventually get a Hicksian demand, right? So that would be the route that you should be familiar with. And um, Slutsky decomposition, we just talked about the Slutsky equation, so you should know what income effect is in terms of the, uh, the Slutsky equation and what substitution effect is. If you are asked to calculate the income effect, how to do that. If you are asked to calculate the substitution effect, how to do that. Um, so one important thing is um, you may notice that the substitution effect uh, is slightly complicated in the Slutsky equation, right? So what I would suggest you to do if you are asked to calculate the substitution effect is to calculate the income effect first and total effect and, and just subtract the income effect from the total effect to get a substitution effect. So you avoid calculating the substitution effect directly, right? So since you have the equation, you have the other two terms, just subtract one from the other to get the, the third. That would be the easiest way to get substitution effect instead of calculating the Hicksian demand, taking the derivative, and then you know, replace the U by the indirect utility function. That would be too much. Um, so I will never expect you to do that in the exam. Uh, and review preference, that's something that I just talked about. And also, um, you still need to remember the math, right? You still know, need to know how to take derivatives. You still need to know what implicit function theorem is so that you, you know how to calculate MRS or MRT, but definitely you don't need to derive anything. And Lagrangian is rarely used in the exam, I would say, because whenever possible, you use the shortcut, which is MRS equals MRT, to avoid Lagrangian to save you, you know, some time. All right, so these are all the important topics. And let's take a look at some um, example questions. So again, you are looking at a Cobb Douglas UT function uh, with exponents being 0.3 and 0.7. You are given the prices, and now it asks you to calculate the total effect. So this question is asking you to calculate the total effect. So it asks you, what's the total change? Um, in the quantity demanded for x for a small increase in px. So that's exactly the derivative of x star with respect to px. So recall that, so in the exam, you should not just give this formula. You should give some calculations um, to obtain this formula, right? Even though you know the conclusion 
uh, for Cobb Douglas utility function, um, the Marshallian demand is just the exponent multiplied by the income divided by the price. Um, so I'm just using the conclusion here, but really you should do some calculations to obtain it. And since you know what X star is, then total effect is just a derivative of this X star with respect to PX. So previously it's PX to the power of negative one. So use the power rule, take down negative one, subtract one from the exponent. So it becomes negative two or, or PX square in the denominator, right? So this is your total effect. And then using Slutsic decomposition, calculate the income effect and substitution effect uh, for the price change above. So just apply the formula. So again, because this question asks you to calculate the substitution effect, we never calculate it directly. Let's calculate income effect first. So if we calculate income effect first, we just apply the formula. Remember to have the negative sign because there is a negative sign in the income effect term. Um, and just take the derivative of X star with respect to I. So here you get rid of the I. Originally it's 0.3 I, but now it's just 0.3 because you take the derivative with respect to I. And multiply by X star itself. So it's it, this, and because we have the negative term, so the, here we have negative term here, negative sign. And eventually we get um, 0.3 squared, which is 0 0.09 times I over PX squared. And you can notice that this term is negative. So this good must be normal good, right? We say that for normal good income effect should be negative. Um, and then substitution effect is just the difference between total effect and income effect. So just subtract this whole thing, including this negative sign from the total effect. So you will get negative 0.21 I over PX squared. So you can see that it's also negative. So for a normal good, all the terms should be negative. So that would be question one. Um, question two, so this question is about review preference. Um, let's say Adam chooses between food, Q1, and drink, Q2. So his um, initial budget is $330 a week. And initially he purchased um, 20, uh, 20 units of food, 20 meals, and then 10 bottles of drink maybe. And uh, okay, so the price for food is $15. $15 per unit and the price of drink is $3 per unit. And we observe his initial consumption bundle. And let's say later his budget rises to 360 a week and the price of drink rises to um, $6 each. So it becomes more expensive, right? The second good becomes more expensive. And the first good is still $15 each. Um, and then as a result, he reduces his consumption of drink to uh, five units and increases his consumption of food to 22 units. So his second bundle, let's say bundle B is 22, five, and his bundle A uh, is, um, 2010. So we want to use review preference reasoning to rank these two bundles. Which one is better? So to be able to do that, we need to make sure that both bundles are affordable. So we just need to check if these two bundles 
are ever both affordable at some point. So in Italy, um, this is the budget line. Okay, initially, uh, Adam has $330, and if he spends all his money on drinks, then he can purchase 110 units, right? So Q2 is drink, Q1 is food. And if Adam um, spends all his money on food, because it's $15 each, it can purchase 22 units. So that would be the budget line. And the initial bundle is somewhere on this budget line, which means uh, Adam exhausts uh, the budget, which is 2010 here. And later, this is the new um, budget line. So now drink becomes more expensive. It's $6 each. And because now Adam has $360, if he spends $360 on drink, it would be um, 360 divided by six, which is 60. So at most, Adam can purchase 60 uh, drinks. And if Adam spends all the money on foods, then it will be 24 uh, units of food. And look, the 22.5 is here, again, on this budget line, which means uh, Adam exhausts uh, his budget. So now we want to compare 2010 and 22.5. So when can we compare these two? Can we compare these two using uh, Adam's initial budget? Clearly not, right? So this purple point or pink point is above the initial budget line, which means this point is not affordable initially. Right? If you calculate how much it would cost Adam under the initial uh, prices, it would be 22 times 15 plus 3 times 5, which is 345. So if Adam were to buy this bundle under the initial prices, he need to pay 345, but it's not affordable because he only had $330 to start with. So we really cannot compare these two uh, under the initial prices. What about uh, later? Can we say 2010 is affordable under the new prices and the new budget? And the answer is yes. So under the new prices, this bundle will cost exactly 360, okay? Um, so under the new prices, the drink is $6 and food is $15. So in total, Adam needs to pay 360. Okay, so because both 2010 and 25 is affordable. And what happened is that Adam chooses this second bundle, 22.5. So it must mean that 22.5 is better than 2010. And to be more rigorous, we say that 22.5 is directly review preferred to 2010. So now we rank these two bundles. So that's the um, review preference reasoning. And if in the exam, you are ever asked to do that, you don't really need to draw the graph. So I'm just drawing the graph to give you a better understanding of what's going on. But to answer this question, really, you can just say something like, uh, because 2010 and 225 are both affordable uh, under the new prices and new budget, but Adam chooses 22.5. So according to review preference reasoning, 22.5 is better than 2010. Okay, you just write that sentence and that's all. You get a full credit if you're ever asked to do that. Um, 
So here I'm, you know, doing a few calculations and drawing the graph to give you a better understanding, but you really don't need to do that um, in the exam, if it's ever in the exam. And a third example question is, okay, now you are given a table, okay, you are given a data. So this is the data set. So in this data set, you observe the behaviors of an individual. So you observe uh, this individual's purchasing behavior in 2017, 2018, and 2019. You notice that in the year 2017, the prices of the two goods are both $5. Um, Clearly, we don't know the unit. It can be 5,000 or whatever, so five. And the consumption levels for the two goods are six and three, okay? So in 2018, you can see that now X becomes more expensive, uh, Y becomes less expensive, and the consumption levels are five and five. And in the year 2019, uh, X becomes even more expensive, but Y is still $4 each. So then um, consumption levels becomes four and five. So the question asks you uh, if this behavior is consistent with the principle of rationality, why or why not? So by saying principle of rationality, really it's uh, just um, the warp. Right, so if A is review preferred to B, then B cannot be review preferred to A. And if, A's, if B is ever chosen, it must be that A is no longer affordable. So that's the definition. So understanding that, what you should do. Um, so you need to figure out how much each bundle will cost the individual. So you need to figure out, okay, we have three bundles, six, three, five, five, and four, five, right? So you need to figure out how much each bundle costs the individual in each year. So that's why we create this new table and under 2017's price, this bundle costs 45, this bundle costs, uh, and then in 2018, this bundle will cost 48 and 54. So we do these calculations Okay, so you should be able to know how to do this calculation. This is simply six times five, the price of X in 2017, plus three times five, the price uh, of Y in 2017, which give you a total of 45. So you're using the new prices to calculate the total cost. Okay, after doing this, what you should do next is to assume that in each year, the individual originally exhausted her budget. What do I mean? So here in 2017, because um, this individual chose 6-3, which cost her 45, we must assume that her budget is 45. We want her to exhaust her budget on these two goods, right? According to utility maximization. So we know that the, in, the income or budget is only 45 in 2017. And in 2018, the budget becomes 50 because this 5.5 five is what is chosen. So this should be affordable. And we assume that um, the individual exhausted her budget in 2018. So 50 is the budget. And in 1948 is the budget. So understanding this, now we can compare or rank the bundles in each year. So in 2017, okay, we see that, okay, both, so let's denote the first bundle as A, second bundle as B, and the third bundle as C. Then we notice that A and C are both affordable, but the individual end up choosing A, so A must be direct review preferred to C. 
in 2018, uh, the budget is 50, which makes all the bundles affordable separately. So we can say that B, some, the, the, the bundle that is chosen, is directly review preferred to A. And bundle B is also directly review preferred to C because neither A or C uh, is chosen. And in 2019, okay, the budget is only 48. So both A and B are not affordable. So we cannot really infer anything from this behavior, right? We, we need at least two to be affordable, to be able to infer some, you know, preferences. And okay, is there any violation of the, of the warp? So when we have ARDC, we cannot have CRDA. We don't have CRDA. When we have BRDA, we cannot have ARDB. We don't have ARDB. When we have BRDC, we cannot have CRDB. Yes, we don't have CRDB. Okay, there's no violation of the principal rationality, but let me ask one more question. Is there any violation of the SARP, strong axiom of review preference? So is there any chain? A, R, D, C, no, there's no C, R, D, something. Uh, B, R, D, A, okay, and A, R, D, C. So we have B, R, D, A, and then A, R, D, C, so B should be indirectly review prefer to C. So we have BRC, but here we have BRDC. So there's also no violation of the SARP. So this behavior is pretty consistent with the principle of rationality and strong axiom of rationality. So we can say that the preference is very consistent throughout the years. So we can feel safe to rank um, B, A, and C. So B is the best, A is in the middle, C is the worst for this individual. So when all three bundles are affordable, at some point we should expect um, the individual to choose B over A and C. That's what we can do with this data set. So um, review preference does not require you to know what's the utility function, you basically just, you know, infer um, the rankings of the goods from the behaviors, from the data, and then maybe use the data to do some predictions under some counterfactual scenarios. And you will see that maybe in the future. Uh, so I think this is just like a very uh, preliminary introduction of review preference. There are tons of research papers in this review preference. And if you are interested, you can maybe just Google review preference and see if there is any paper. But for the purpose of this class, you just need to know how to do these two types of reasoning and calculations, and that's all. Um, um, I had a quick question on that. Yes. How can we tell in 2017 that it's preferred to see when they're the same price? Um, yeah, so because they are both affordable, right? Because they are both $45 in total. Mm -hmm. But from the previous table, we see that this individual is choosing 6.3 instead of 4.5. So 6.3 is the chosen one and 4.5 is the one that is not chosen. Oh, okay. So Makes sense. from this behavior, we must be able to infer that A is directly review preferred to C, according to the definition. Okay, thank you. All right, so um, that's all I wanna say today and hope, I hope that this is helpful for you and hopefully you will see some similar questions tomorrow. Um, so this is almost the end. Uh, I can probably answer one more question if you have any, otherwise I will just hold extra office hour this afternoon starting at 4 p.m. Pacific time. Um, um, any question? Yeah, I wanted to know like how many questions would be there in the paper? Um, 
I would say three or four, um, slightly fewer than last time. Um, so maybe um, one or two short questions and then uh, two long questions, MOs. So like we don't have so many topics that we covered for this yeah. paper. So I guess like the, uh, the questions will be around like reveal preference and the Slutsky equation. Mostly. Yeah, and kind of like the relationship between UMP and EMP. So it's just focus on these few new topics. We don't have a lot of things to, to test you. So just there will be no surprise. All right. Thank you. All right. So um, this is already the end of the class. I would like to end the meeting. And if you have more questions, please just come to the office hour this afternoon. All right. Um, so thank you. See you guys. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.